Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be reading the book of Mark. This is the first uh, installment of that book. This is Mark chapter 1, and it is going to be an awesome time because, you know, every one of these Gospels has a little bit different point of view. It's almost like... It's almost like uh, getting a news story from different news companies, different news agencies, okay? So, uh, yeah, we're reading the good news according to Mark now, the gospel according to Mark. Now, Mark, I, I notice he packs a lot more. It's more condensed. He packs a lot more into, uh, into his gospel. He doesn't have as many chapters as other gospels do. And so, yeah, it's like really like, you know, condensed. It's like really... Com- what would you call it? Compressed uh, information here. So let's get right to it. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, or you might say the beginning of the gospel of Yeshua, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. This is Malachi, or Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. That's found in Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. Notice that God sends someone ahead to prepare. Jesus just just didn't do it all on his own. He just wasn't like the one man band, so to speak. He he had a team, and John the Baptist was part of that team, going ahead of him, preparing the people for the way. In the same way, in your life, you need to prepare the way of the Lord in your life. I know a lot of people might say, "Well, you know, come to the Lord just as you are. You know, He will accept you just as you are," and this kind of thing. Well, you need to prepare your heart. before You don't just come in the presence of the king just with any old attitude, with any old junk, with any old filth on your face. You know, you, you don't go into, uh, you know, an earthly court with, you know, just, just looking any way you want to. I mean, so why would you go into a heavenly court looking just any way you want to, spiritually speaking? You've got to do what you can. To prepare yourself. Prepare the way of the Lord. Let's see how John prepared the way. Verse 4, John came came baptizing in the wilderness. I've said this before. I'll say it again. That the whole idea of baptism didn't start with John. Okay, Just because you don't really see it explicitly spoken of before John doesn't mean that, the, that it wasn't in existence before John. Actually, uh, I understand that... Um, Ancient uh, archaeological records and ar- archaeological evidence proves that there was baptismal tanks, there was baptismal places of baptism way before John ever came. You know, the, uh, the whole idea of baptism started way, way, way before John was born. We see uh, baptism, figuratively speaking, in the flood of the no- in the flood of Noah. Also in the um, the, the crossing of the Red Sea for, of the children of Israel when they went through the Red Sea, uh, figuratively speaking. Again, also when their children went through the River Jordan, uh, figuratively speaking. Okay, and, and we know here that uh, John is it, you know right there at the River Jordan, perhaps even in the very location that the children of Israel crossed from the wilderness over to the promised land. So John came baptizing. Now it says here in my notes that baptizing also means immerse, immersing, immersing, <laughs> immersing, excuse me, immersing. So the word baptizing is not just some nice little word, some little, you know, nice little coin little word that somebody just made up this cool word, you know, called baptizing. Baptizing is actually a transliteration from the Greek baptizo. Baptizo is a Greek word which means to immerse. I understand that there was uh, at one point in time, uh, way back when, you know, even uh, dating over a thousand years, I, I actually I think it might have been even around the time of Christ. I don't have the figures right here in front of me. But there was a, an ancient recipe found written in Greek on how to make pickles. Okay, and so taking the cucumbers and immersing them in the water for a long period of time 
they use the same word, baptizo. Baptizo. So to be baptized is to be immersed, to be completely covered. And I know that there's, you know, a lot of churches, or at least some churches that don't practice, you know, full immersion in water. And I understand that the reason why they didn't do that is, historically speaking, there were times and places where you just could not get to a body of water large enough to baptize people, and you needed to baptize them. So you got to do what you got to do with whatever you have at hand, right? And so a lot of times people only had, you know, a matter of just a little bit of water there at hand. So they baptized them uh, with a little bit of water, and that just... it grew into this tradition of just using a small amount of water to baptize someone. But l- really and literally, it's immersing somebody in water. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. Again, you got to keep this in context, and I mean culturally as well. So we have John, whose real name was Yehokanan, uh, in Hebrew, which was a Jew, a full, a full, full-on Jew, okay? And so he was baptizing Jews. And so the whole idea of baptism was, uh, was in, in Jewish, um, culture way before uh, John came. So the baptism of repentance was, it, it, it's the idea of when you repent, you, cl- you clean yourself. And so, Baptism in water is is a, is an act that's done to show that you're cleaning yourself. You've cleaned yourself, okay? And this is what repentance, the baptism of repentance is. The baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins is that you have repented. Again, I will stress this because a lot of people don't know what the word repent means. It means to change, literally to change, okay? In the Hebrew, uh, to make shuva, uh, which means to actually um, return, you know, to come back to a, a, a pure state. Okay, in the Greek, uh, where where we get our um, New Testament, uh, so-called New Testament manuscripts, mostly were written in Greek. Uh, the word means to change your mind. Okay, to return to your pure way of, of thinking. To to strip yourself and to clean yourself of all the filth that you've gained in life, okay? So, the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins is when you repent, you change. Not just feel sorry. Because we know, as it says in the book of Hebrews, that Esau felt sorry so much so that he wept. But it says that he did not find repentance. There was no place of repentance found for him. So, He did not attain repentance, yet he was very, very sorrowful to the point where he was weeping, okay? The baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, before I move on, I want to also make it very clear. It is, we're talking about Scripture here. We got to compare Scripture with Scripture. And throughout Scripture, you see, you repent first, then you get forgiveness. Look at um, Ezekiel chapter 18, where it says, you know, if you were wicked and then you now you're righteous, you've repented. You've re- repented of your wickedness. You've turned from your wickedness. You've changed your mind on the way you, you live and the way you think. So uh, you are no more a sinner. You are a saint. You are no more wicked. You are righteous. And so then you attain forgiveness of sins. It says that God will forgive your sins then because he doesn't condemn you or judge you based upon who you were. It's who you are. Okay? Same goes if you were righteous, but now you're wicked. You're not going to get anything, uh, any kind of reward for your righteousness or any kind of, you know, anything from God at all. Because that righteousness, when you threw that righteousness away, when you threw your righteous life away and now you're living wicked, you threw all of the blessings with it, you know, as well. You threw righteousness away. So all you get is now is the reward of wickedness, okay? So if you want to be forgiven, you've got to repent, okay? As it says in Proverbs, first comes repentance, first comes uh, you know, changing of your heart, changing of your mind, then comes mercy. Okay? So forgiveness of sins is 
preceded by repentance. Always, 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 always. That's why Jesus preached repentance at the start of his ministry, during his ministry, after he died and rose again, he preached repentance. Uh, he preached repentance to his church in the book of Revelation, chapter uh, chapters 2 and 3. Keep in mind, it's to his church, not to the world. He preached repentance. Let's move on. Uh, verse 5. All the country of Judea and all those of Jerusalem went out to him. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, there must have been something very powerful and unique about John the Baptist that everybody would go out to him. I mean, he wasn't just some crazy man off the street or just some homeless guy or just some dirty guy wearing just a bunch of dirty uh, you know, animal skins and you know, having a locust hanging out on one side of his mouth and honey dripping out on the other side. No. He was someone who had power and the endorsement of God that would cause so many people to come out and, and, and listen to him. Verse 6, John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and honey. Locusts and wild honey. I understand that even today in the world, there are uh, countries where it is a delicacy, where locusts and wild honey, there are even recipes you can find on cooking locusts and wild honey. And it's actually, it's actually a, di a dish that you cook together. Uh, it's like honey glazed locusts, so to speak. Um, but yeah, you can, you can actually even get the recipe today. Verse 7, he preached saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and loosen. He's not even worthy to undo his shoelace is basically what he said. Okay, He's not worthy to do that. Verse 8, I baptized you in water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, in those days, Yeshua, Jesus, came from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. Now, let me just highlight this this thing, like a dove, because a lot of people think that the Holy Spirit like was like appeared like actually appeared as a dove. It doesn't say that. It does not say that. It doesn't say that John the Baptist saw a dove or anybody saw a dove. It just says that the Spirit descended on him like a dove. Verse eleven, a voice came out of the sky. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 12, Immediately the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. Okay? So, again, look at this. This is, there are a lot of things here that are very significant. The number 40 is very significant. I just mentioned earlier about the flood of Noah. 40 days and 40 nights it rained, it says. Moshe, Moses, when he went up to get the uh, tablets, it says that he spent 40 days and 40 nights. The children of Israel spent 40 days in, or excuse me, 40 years in the wilderness. Okay? And likewise, Yeshua here, I mean, Yeshua here, Yeshua is, or I should say, Israel, the children of Israel, are uh, a representation of Yeshua. Because Yeshua here spent 40 days in the wilderness, tempted by Satan. Pretty much the same as the children of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness, tempted by Satan. It says, he was with the wild animals and the angels were serving him. Just as, you know, the children of Israel, they were with the wild animals and the children were serving them as well. Also take note that in Jew again, you got to look at this from a Jewish point of view, and you cannot read a Jewish document written by a Jewish author with a Gentile mind. So when it says in verse 13 that he was with the wild animals, sure you can say, okay, it was really literally wild animals. But it, to the Jewish mind, Gentiles are wild animals. Gentiles are wild animals. That's why, that's why 
Jesus called Herod a fox. That's why um, Jesus called the Canaanite woman a dog. Okay, so he was with the wild animals, it says, which it could be, again, symbolic of, uh, or actually, let me just turn it around the other way, where the, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, you know, driving out the Canaanite, the, the Hittite, the, the Jebusite, the Perizzite, and all the, all the other ites, symbolic of being in the wilderness with the wild animals. And the angels were serving him. Verse 14. Now, after John was taken into custody... Jesus came into Galilee. Okay, so John was arrested. He was arrested. He was taken into custody. He was put in jail. Okay, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the good news of God's kingdom, saying, the time is fulfilled the, the, and God's kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Okay, so yeah. Jesus' first message was repent. Preacher, Christian, you're supposed to take Jesus as your example. If you're a true Christian, you're supposed to look up to Jesus and say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Jesus preached repentance, first and foremost. Primary. Primary message was, was repentance. Not himself. He didn't go saying, I am the Messiah. Come to me. I will not cast you out. Like how they preach today. He preached repentance. Because he knew repentance comes before salvation. Repent and believe in the good news. That's the gospel. According to Jesus. The gospel according to the disciples, as we're going to read later. That's the first message they preached. That's the gospel according to the book of Acts. That's what they preached there. That's the gospel according to the post-resurrected Jesus in the book of Revelation to his church, chapters 2 and 3. Verse 16, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, or Shimon, and Andrew, the brother of Simon, Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you into fishers for men. I like the way how the Lord, you know, he meets you where you are kind of thing, you know. Um, he calls you out of where you are. <laughs> but uh, a lot of times he meets you where you are. To the, to the scientist, he can meet you on the scientific level. To the book reader, he can, he, can, he can meet you in books. Uh, to the fisherman, he can meet you at the sea and use your own lingo and say, I'll make you a fisherman of men. Uh, you know, he meets you in all different places. He uses your current location and condition to pave a way for him, okay? Verse 18, immediately... They left their nets and followed him. Okay, again, Simon and Andrew, they must have known a lot about Jesus beforehand. Okay. And we're going to get into this. We're going to read in, we're going to read the what some might, some people might call the forbidden texts or the apocrypha, uh, the un the, you know, the documents that did not make it into mainstream Bibles today. Okay. And a lot of these documents record. Um, are ancient documents that also date back to around the same time as uh, as these documents were written. Um, but they record a lot of things that Jesus did before the fact, before this, okay? Miracles and, and different, uh, you know, happenings that really caused people to take notice uh, on, take notice of this young man by the name of Yeshua. And we're going to get into that. But I believe that Simon and Andrew heard a lot or saw a lot before this whole thing of Jesus. I mean, you, you just can't, you can't just go. And I know some, some of you might, might say, oh, anything's possible with the Lord. You know, miracle might have happened. But I think that God is more practical than a lot of people, a lot of you think. I think that he's a lot more practical than a lot of you think. If God's going to give you a brand new house, he's actually going to send workers there to build it for you. Okay, he's not, he can create it himself just like that. But he's going he's gonna to send someone there to pour the foundation, to build the walls. You know, I think he's a lot more practical than you think he is. So 
on that note, I think that it was a lot more practical, this whole thing. I don't think that if... I don't think that anybody can just go to a, a fisherman back in those days. Just any old Joe Blow that was just unknown guy, just go up to a couple of fishermen and say, "Come and follow me," and they would just drop everything and leave their ho- leave their families, leave their lives, leave their livelihood, leave their jobs just to follow a, a stranger. I think that they knew Jesus from before. Um, I know you might say, "Oh, you're reading a lot into the text of what it doesn't say." No, I'm not. I'm I'm telling you what a lot of the other ancient texts say that is not in the original canonized mainstream Bible. But again, I'm going to get into all that detail later. Verse 18. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Again, there's a good reason why, which we're not told here. Uh, verse 19, going on a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John. So there's James and John, some of the, the two of his closest, you know, friends, disciples. His brother, and uh, who were also in a boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Again, there must have been some compelling evidence that they had that they need to go follow after Jesus when Jesus called. It doesn't say that it was just a miracle. It does not say that. I know a lot of you think, that, oh yeah, it could be just a miracle, just some magical thing about Jesus that just caused people just to follow him. It's not what it says. Okay? And God's a lot more practical than a lot of people think. Verse 21 by the way, God created the practical, okay? Uh, they went into Capernaum. Again, Capernaum is, uh, is a uh, com- compound word here, Capernaum, which is literally in the Hebrew, Kafer, uh, Nahum. Kafer means village. Nahum would be the prophet Nahum, which you all should know of uh, from the Old Testament. So they went into the village of the prophet Nahum and... and Immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Again, Jesus didn't build his church right there. I mean, didn't build, didn't build a church building. He went to synagogue. Jesus went to synagogue. His people went to synagogue. His followers went to synagogue. Here, later, in his life, after his death, in the book of Acts, they went to synagogue. Paul went to synagogue. They always went to synagogue. That was their custom, going to synagogue. And preaching the gospel In the synagogue. Again, WWJD, what would Jesus do? He wouldn't build a a brick building and put a steeple on it and call call it a church. Okay? He went to synagogue. For those of you who don't know, the word church actually means people. It means the the called out people, the the holy people, the, the ones that are called out separate from the world system, those who are dedicated and um yeah, dedicated to God. Um, that's what the word church means. It doesn't mean a building. So the church, biblically, you want to talk biblically, the church went to synagogue. Ha ha ha. Verse 22, they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes. Again, the scribes are the ones that actually were the publishers of the scriptures back then. They were the ones that wrote out all the scriptures. They're the ones that copied it. Of course, they didn't have the printing press. They didn't have photocopiers back then. They had scribes that copied from one to the, to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. So the scribes taught because they actually wrote it, but they taught, but Jesus taught with more authority than the scribes. Why? The scribes wrote, the scribes copied the written Tanakh. But Jesus was the living, personified Tanakh. What the scribes put down on paper was a paper representation of the real deal, which is Yeshua. Okay? They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught at them as having authority and not as the scribes. No wonder, because he is the one. He is the Tanakh. Those of you who think that, oh, we don't go by the law no more. Well, do you go by Jesus? If you go by Jesus, you're going by the law. Trust me, because Jesus is the personification of that law. 
As Psalm 119 says, the psalm that speaks of God's Torah throughout the whole entire psalm, every, every verse talks about word, judgments, precepts, uh, law, Torah, um, commandments. Uh, every single verse, the longest chapter of the Bible, it says, your word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. It says forever settled in heaven. Not just temporarily until Mashiach comes, not just temporarily until Jesus comes and he changes things. No. God forbid. He is the living, eternal, unchanging, unchangeable word of God. Why is the word of God unchangeable from Genesis to Revelation? Why? Because God is unchangeable from, Reve from Genesis to Revelation. Verse 23, immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Okay, this is, we're talking about an unclean spirit, what a lot of people would call demons today. Now what we're talking about is a real spirit, a, pers a personality. Okay, these unclean spirits, they have their own mind, they have their own will, they have, they can speak of, their self, of themselves. They are person, they are beings. And they operate as such. So immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, Ha! What do we have to do with you, Yeshua? You Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. I know you. Who you are. The Holy One of God. May I say this? Uh, even the unclean spirits, even the demons believe more than, than the atheists do. The atheists are an even worse. An atheist, I, I really don't even believe in atheists anyway because I, I just don't believe in atheists. I believe that they're just, it's just a mask for them. They're just covering up their, their lifestyle. Um, put them face to face to, with death and... A lot of most atheists are going to become a little bit less, less atheists, put it that way. Um, but even atheists uh, that say that they don't believe in Jesus, they don't believe uh, you know in the holy God, whatever. Even unclean spirits, unclean, filthy, evil demons are have it better than they know more than these atheists do. Just the truth, according to the scriptures. Okay. According to the scriptures, I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm here to relate with to you what the Bible says. You know the book that's in almost every home in the developed world? Or at least the majority of them? Plus in many other uh, dignitaries' homes and buildings, by the way. Verse 25, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Jesus didn't want to be known. He wasn't there to start a ministry. He wasn't there to get attention. He wasn't there to build a reputation, to build a, what would you call it, a client base. He wasn't there for that. He didn't want to be recognized. Be quiet. He could have said, oh, you know, thanks for telling everybody exactly who I am. I am the Holy One of God. He just said, be quiet, come out of him. Verse 26, the unclean spirit convulsed him and cry, crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. The report of him um, uh, went out immediately everywhere into all the region of Galilee and its surrounding area. Immediately, when they had come out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's wife, uh, interesting, Simon was married. Uh, Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. So she had some kind of an infection, be it a cold or a flu or some other kind of infection. And immediately they told him about her. He came and took her by the hand and raised her up. The fever left her immediately. Okay. And she served them. So 
Notice Jesus did not pray like a lot of preachers do today. He didn't say a word. Okay? He didn't say a word. He didn't pray, at least not according to this account. He just took her by the hand and raised her up. And she was healed. Verse 32, At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were possessed by demons, by evil spirits, unclean spirits, beings, personalities. All the city was gathered together at the door. He healed many who who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. He didn't allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So again, he didn't want everybody to know who he was. He enjoyed his privacy. Shh, don't tell anybody. He even told the demons, don't tell anybody. Now, once again, let's not get, let's not forget in our minds the context here. He's preaching repentance. We just read that just several verses several verses ago. He's preaching repentance. He's preaching against sin. He's preaching righteousness. He's preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means the rule of God. And you can't have a rule of anybody without rules, obviously. One plus one is two. One equals one, okay? You can't have rules You can't have a rule without rules, okay? You can't have a rule of a king without rules. So Jesus is saying, you can come under the rule of God, under the law of God. You can come into the kingdom of God. You can fit in easily, okay? That's what he means by the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's easy to attain. It's right there, easy to grasp. You don't have to go up into heaven. It's just Deuteronomy 30 all over again. As as Paul said, not by works, but by faith. So that's what Paul meant by that, by the way. So he went. He was. He was using a, the the backdrop of Deuteronomy chapter thirty, where he says, "You don't have to. You don't have to build a ladder way up into some other galaxy or beyond the universe. You don't have to dig down into the core of the earth. You don't have to do these great mighty feats. You don't have to do a lot of work. You don't have to. It's right there. The 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 rule of God." coming into his rule, coming into his law, coming coming into, fitting in, using God's law, his instructions, his guidelines according to the Spirit of God as made known to us in the Scriptures, the Tanakh, and then some, okay, and beyond, is easy. As Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, think about this, after Moshe brought down the Torah, brought down all the law of God and everything else at the, near the very end of, of everything, you know, the wrapping it up, saying the last words. The last words were basically Deuteronomy 30. It's easy. God's not a tyrant that he should command and he should bark out commands that you cannot do, okay? He's not abusive. He's not a father that commands his son to build a ladder up to Galaxy X, okay? And, and demands it being done or else you're going to burn in the fire. No. He commands things that are easy to do, you know? So, this is the context, okay? So, though my point is this. People would not be coming to Jesus in that context, preaching repentance, preaching righteousness, preaching God's word, God's law. To the most holy man in the, uh, the, holy man in the, in the universe, Jesus, People wouldn't be coming to him, enduring his teachings, without somehow having some kind of repentance in their heart, in their life. Okay? So this is the context of repentance. Like I said, I know, I've heard preachers pray that everybody in their meeting would get healed, and all they got to do is pray and rebuke the devil, whatever else. Everybody in the meeting will be healed. Yeah, I heard it prophesied, you know, by one of these high-fluking, charismatic Preachers that one day before Jesus will come back, everybody in, in, in the meeting will be healed. Well, you got to start preaching repentance heavy and hard like Jesus did. And you got to give people the opportunity to leave your meeting. Don't lock the doors once they're in because these people, they it was open air preaching, so these people could have easily left. They didn't have to come. They didn't have to stay. 
They decided to come. They decided to stay. Remember, Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify its deeds are evil. Okay? So these people are people who are able to endure that kind of preaching. And you cannot endure that kind of preaching without being having some grain of holiness in you somewhere. Some grain of repentance in you somewhere. Okay? So that's the context of all these miracles. Verse 35, early in the morning, while it was still dark, he rose up and went out and departed into a deserted place and prayed there. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. Okay, so Jesus went in and prayed. He, he did a lot of praying here, okay? So he, um, he went into a deserted place. He didn't want anybody to see again, you know? Not like a lot of these preachers today. They go on TV or go on, you know, on public meetings and they want to hear, they want everybody to hear them pray or want to see what God has done in my ministry. Jesus is always like, shh, don't tell anybody. Verse 37, they found him and told him, everyone is looking for you. Jesus, what are you doing, man? You pray. Everyone's looking for you. He said to them, Let's go elsewhere into the next towns that I may preach there also because I came out for this reason. Okay? What is he preaching again? Repentance. Okay? Keep it in context. Verse 39. He went into their synagogues. Again, he went to synagogue. Synagogue. Throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out de uh, demons. Verse 40. A leper came to him, begging him, kneeling down and saying to him, If you want to, you can make me clean. Uh, Jesus didn't say, Oh, you don't have enough faith. You said, If you want me to. If you want me to. You're just, you don't have enough faith. You should be saying that I want you to. You should be saying, Jesus, make me clean. I know you want me to be clean. I got faith for that. He didn't say that. Being moved with compassion, again, look at, see, some people, again, some Christians believe that the age of miracles have passed because miracles is only was only there for to somehow give credibility to the Bible. Not true. That's not what the Bible says about the miracles. I mean, one, I mean, one of the purposes of the miracles, Jesus said, is to lead people to repentance. He said, you know, if the miracles done in, in your city was done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago and they would have been, they would, they would have remained, but they didn't. But they didn't see the miracles that you see. So Jesus charged them with responsibility. You saw miracles, you have the responsibility to repent. So that's one purpose of the miracles is to bring, lead people to repentance. But this is another purpose here, being moved with compassion. The, the purpose of these miracles, this miracle in particular, or at least the motive of this miracle by the Lord was compassion. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I want to be made clean. Does God still have the same compassion as he did then? Does Jesus still have the uh, same compassion as, as he did then? Obviously, yes. I, I think everybody would agree. Verse 42. When he had said this, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was made clean. He strictly warned him, uh, and immediately sent him out and said to him, See that you say nothing to anybody, but go show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing the things which Moses commanded for a testimony to them. Okay? Again, here he goes. Don't say anything to anybody. Not like some of the preachers today. Come on forward to the platform and show everybody. Oh, come on for a oh, uh, praise report. Let's, let, let's file a praise report. We want everybody just to say hallelujah. What they're really saying is, I want you to come and I want I want to show everybody what God has done through this ministry. I want to see I want everybody to see what God has done through this church. So invite your friends to this church. Invite your friends to these meetings. That's not the way Jesus was. Verse 45. But he went out and began to proclaim it much. Uh-oh, he didn't do what Jesus said to do. And spread it spread about the matter so that Jesus could no more openly enter into a city, but was outside in uh desert places. People came to him from everywhere. Okay, so it caused a little bit of hardship for Jesus, okay? Um yeah, so that concludes our reading of Matthew chapter 1. I hope this was a blessing to you. May God open the eyes of your understanding and give you great understanding, show you great and mighty things as you seek Him. For as we know, if you seek Him 
If you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Thanks again for watching.